Hi everyone, this is Jason Burak of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I like having him on every couple months to talk about the oil and energy markets. He's definitely an expert in that industry. He runs the Energy Prospectus Group and has over 30 years of experience working in the oil and gas industry. Dan Steffens, thanks for coming back. Yeah, hi Jason. Thanks for having me. Now, Dan, I want to talk about OPEC here. Uh, There's been a lot of people in the mainstream media the last couple years, really since, like, I think 2008, they've been saying that OPEC's lost a lot of its power. Uh, You know, shale oil is going to destroy them, and their their market share, they would lose a lot of their market share, and they would eventually become irrelevant. Uh, How much power do you think OPEC still has over controlling oil prices? Well, I, they obviously still have a lot of control over it. I mean, this decision back in November to, you know, jack up their production to try to gain market share, uh, you know, caused this big drop or accelerated the drop. It was already coming down you know, when they did that. But, it, um, you know, we've been flopping around here on the lows for several months now. So. Yeah, and the the thing about, like, for statistics for OPEC's market share, I think when they started OPEC, I believe it was in the 60s, mm-hmm. uh, OPEC had around 40% market share of the total oil market, and then it dropped, I think at one point a couple decades ago, down to around 20% of the market, and they fought really hard uh, over the last decade or so to get it back to around, I think it's back to around 40%. So, I mean, I don't know the people who say OPEC doesn't have any power. I don't know what they're looking at when, you know, it's a, it's, it's a cartel. And it seems to me they have a lot of influence over price because they are low-cost producers, at least most of them are. And it seems to me they have at least some effect on being able to manipulate prices up or down. Well, pretty much outside of OPEC, the only country that's exporting oil is Russia. So uh, they have the excess capacity. So they have all the worlds uh, for the for the companies that are net importers. Uh, that They definitely rely on OPEC production to meet their needs. So yeah, they have they're the ones that uh you know hold the hold the strings for the market. Yeah, and you brought up excess capacity and during the oil crisis I think in the 70s OPEC had a lot of excess capacity and I think now the Saudis are running around 9 and a half 10 million barrels per day of oil production. They don't have that extra capacity that they did in during the 70s oil crisis to just drastically flood the market. Um mm-hmm. you told me earlier in hmm? Yeah, well, right now, right now, the only country that has excess production capacity is Saudi Arabia. Everybody else has got, you know, the, the, the gas pedal pushed to the floor. They're exporting everything they can export. Uh, they're trying to make up for the loss in price by just exporting more. And uh, really, it's kind of ridiculous because if they all agreed to just cut back production 10%, uh, the price would probably go back up and their revenues would be higher. So, uh, you know, it really doesn't make a lot of sense what they're doing. But, uh, you know, they're trying to, you know, slow down shale oil production in the, in the U.S. and anywhere else. And, and they're also just trying to maintain their market share. And I think the part of this is that I think Saudi Arabia really got tired of being the one doing all the production cuts. Uh, they Prior to the November meeting, I think they went around and talked to the other OPEC members and was just nobody else would agree to cut. So this is this is more to almost punish their own members than it is to punish the U.S. shale producers. That's interesting. And you said you think Saudi Arabia is the only one with um, excess production capacity, but Iran claims to. I know. I, I listened to other experts, not yourself, but other people who at least pay attention to the oil markets are claiming that Iran's going to, in the near future, because of this um, power deal that they did with the U.S., are going to dump either 500,000 barrels per day or up to a million barrels per day onto the market. So you don't see that happening then? Well, I mean, they have excess production capacity except for the sanctions. So until those sanctions are lifted, and there's a lot of confusion over the Iranian deal, uh, you know, even if it does go through Congress or even, you know, if Congress votes it down, but Obama overrides him with a veto and goes ahead and approves the thing, uh, the, the sanctions don't automatically get lifted until what's called implementation day. Well, implementation day is not defined in the agreement. That requires the approval of the uh, International Nuclear Energy Agency and there's, I think, 17 key points that Iran has to set aside before the sanctions get lifted. So let's say this deal is approved next month in October. Uh, it's going to take several months, probably at least six months, for, for the Atomic Energy Agency to uh, finish their study and the report that 
Iran is meeting all the requirements, and they have to do all these inspections of sites and, and all kind of things. And, and uh, you know, that remains to be seen. I mean, what if Saudi Arabia, even after the deal gets approved, doesn't allow them to come into several of their military sites, which they've never let them do before, and, uh, you know, the sanctions don't get lifted. So uh, anything could happen. But from an operational standpoint, yeah, they got a lot of production shut in. And they can get out there and probably relatively quickly raise production by a couple hundred thousand barrels a day. But it would probably take at least a year for them to get anywhere close to pre-sanction production levels. And it doesn't seem like they it would be smart for them, like you mentioned earlier, to be putting all that extra oil on the market now when you know there's there's um, a case to be made that there's at least a two or three percent oversupply in the market for the marginal barrel of oil. It makes sense for them to hold on to that oil and w- let the price go up and then start selling the oil when demand increases. Well, for one thing, I think the market is going to be able to absorb that extra production by then anyway, because uh, production outside of OPEC is on decline. I mean, U.S. production is on decline. Uh, Russia is probably on decline. Uh, you know, these these lower prices are not just hurting the shale players; they're hurting everybody. Uh, I've seen reports of numerous offshore projects being canceled that would have represented a million barrels a day. Uh, probably by the time the sanctions are lifted, lifted against Iran, our production will have declined a million barrels a day. Uh, the EIA just reported yesterday that we're down from, we peaked at about 9.6, 9.7 million barrels a day, and we're already down to 9.3 million barrels a day. And my guess, by the end of the year, we're going to be well under 9 million barrels a day. So our production is falling because you just cannot possibly have the sharp decline in in uh, drilling for oil that we've had. I mean, our rig count peaked at 1,609 rigs back in October uh, they had a lot of wells to complete, so the momentum was still going. So production continued to rise through the first quarter. But as of uh, April, we probably, uh, we well, not probably, it's now been confirmed, we were, we started on decline in April, and we're already well off our peak. And uh, based on what I've been hearing, uh, I think our production is going to have a big drop in the fourth quarter, like 500,000 barrels a day from today to the end of the year is probably what we're looking at. Yeah, and to add to your points there about the shale oil production, I mean, those wells deplete very rapidly. And then also the capital that was available a year or two ago or after 2008, 2009, that was funding this this rapid boom in shale oil growth, production growth, it's not there as much as it used to. I think we've seen over $150 billion in CapEx cuts in the oil market just in the last year or so. And that's a massive amount of cuts. And a lot of these shale oil producers, you know, besides the rapid depletion rates and stuff, they have a decent amount of debt that they have to deal with that they're going to have to figure out how to pay that debt back to um, so their uh, companies don't go bankrupt. Yeah, there, there's a lot of companies that have kind of gone into what I call hunker down mode. mode. They just cut back on all unnecessary drilling. Uh, a lot of rigs were released. Uh, even even penalties were pay, paid on those rig contracts to release the rigs. Uh, and also, there's a lot of companies that uh, are drilling wells now but not completing them because on these shale wells, the completion costs are as much or more than the drilling costs. So they can drill the wells to hold their acreage, but they don't have to complete them for a while so they can put them in inventory. Uh, but the, I think the well completions between now and the end of the year is going to drop drastically. And it's the drilling of wells not does not bring on production. It's the completion of those wells. And these shale wells all have to be tied into pipelines before they can be brought online. So uh, it's just, it's just going to result in a lot less uh, decline because we think about this from a math kind of a mathematical standpoint. Uh, last year, uh, 37,000 wells were completed in the United States. We're probably only looking in the fourth quarter less than 5,000 wells being completed. So just the math. I mean, if if uh, those wells that were completed last year. Uh, the shale wells, horizontal shale wells, have all declined 60%, 70% in production. You're just not drilling enough wells to offset the decline of the wells that were just drilled last year, not to mention all the legacy wells that were drilled prior to that are all in decline. So uh, it's just mathematically impossible to maintain production when you've got that many wells on steep decline. 
Uh, are you surprised we haven't seen a lot of major mergers and acquisitions yet for shale oil producers? I know we've seen Halliburton buy Baker Hughes, and we've seen Schlumberger recently make a bid for Cameron International, but those are you know oil service companies and drillers and things like that. Those aren't the producers. Uh, are you surprised we haven't seen the uh, the E and P companies do uh, mergers and acquisitions yet? Well, in previous price uh, price cycles like this that we've had, the mergers usually start happening when the industry is confident that prices have bottomed or, and are on the way up. Because it's really, if you're a publicly traded E&P company, it's hard to justify to the market, well, I'm making this acquisition, but the oil price is going down. So it looks like you're buying, you know, reserve uh, assets. It looks like you're overpaying, down about, right? Yeah, it looks like you're overpaying, and you have to explain that to Wall Street, and, and so they don't want to do it. So they wait till they have a high level of confidence that the price is going up. Now, what you're going to see and what everybody's anticipating is that you're going to see these companies that are getting to the end of their hedged production because a lot of, a lot of companies were hedged through the end of this year, and then the hedges, amount of hedged production drops off rapidly. So you're going to see banks putting pressure on some of these companies to sell assets or just sell outright. Uh, so on the upstream companies – I think in the next few months we should start seeing some acquisitions. And I think I, what I can see some companies doing is they're they're shoring up their balance sheets and their you know access to capital in order to get ready to make these acquisitions. Because you know now they can buy into these shale plays for a heck of a lot cheaper than what they could have a year ago, uh, you know, on an acreage basis or however you want to want to put it. But uh, yeah, there's a lot. A lot, a lot of potential deals to be made. And this is just typical every cycle. You just see this kind of the big guys with the got the strong balance sheets and a lot of cash. They swallow up the littler companies, and that's how they get bigger. Yeah, Whiting Petroleum bought Kodiak Oil and Gas towards the top mm -hmm. of the market there, and right. now it's down low. They have a lot of debt. They've had to do, you know, emergency capital raises. I'm surprised we haven't seen, you know, a large oil company make a bid for them yet or for, you know, Oasis Petroleum, which has good acreage up there, I think, in the Bakken as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Bakken is one area that has suffered the most because their net backs are much lower. Uh, your wellhead price is net of all the transportation and what it takes to get that oil to market. Well, the Bakken, because of where it's located, has the highest transportation cost net back to the to the companies. So, yeah, they've kind of suffered. I mean, at it, it, forty dollar oil, it's just uh, unsustainable to be drilling in the Bakken. It, it makes no sense right now because your net backs are probably more like thirty dollars. And so, you know, to bring these wells on it, that deplete rapidly, uh, you just want to wait until prices come back up. So, uh, actually, I've looked pretty hard at Oasis, and it looks pretty decent to me. It seems like it's oversold. In fact, it's one of the companies that's actually reporting uh, decent net income. Uh, you, you mentioned Whiting. It was one of the companies I follow pretty closely, and, yeah, they overpaid for the Kodiak deal because they took on a bunch of debt when they did it. But, you know, they're – no doubt, they're a powerhouse up in the Bakken, and they own a, and control a lot of uh, reserves up there. Uh, are you surprised that we haven't seen dividend cuts then from ExxonMobil, Chevron, some of the larger oil companies? They didn't cut dividends in 2008, but we've had you know a prolonged oil price slump for uh, for the price staying pretty low, with people thinking it could go lower. Although we've had a rally recently. And, you know, we've seen MLP producers like Lynn Energy and stuff cut back on their distribution. So are you surprised the, the real big boys who weren't really hedged that much with oil production that they haven't cut dividends? Well, those companies like uh, Exxon, for one thing, they're, they're integrated companies. So they have refining and marketing divisions also. Well, the refiners are actually benefit from lower crude prices because their spread, their profit margin on refined products is that much better. And uh, so that kind of insulates them a little bit from the price decline. Plus, they have, you know, very strong balance sheets, so they don't have to cut dividends, and, and they don't want to get into that that mode of cutting dividends. Now, some of the uh, upstream MLPs, it's kind of surprised me that some of these guys have had to cut their dividends so sharply since they have a high percentage of their uh, revenues protected by hedges, but they also, they carry a lot of debt, and so, um, you know, they've got to focus on debt service first. I mean, it's, survival is more important than paying those dividends, so they're, you know, getting cutting cutting the distributions, which were high, which were very high. I mean, if you go back to where uh, Lynn was paying distributions, those were you'd have 20 or 30 percent annual yield on where they are now. So, uh, 
you know, it doesn't make sense for them to throw all that cash out when they really just need to be paying down debt and stuff like that. So, so they were they were worried then about a, a, a further bond downgrade then, and that's why they uh, they cut the distribution to pay back debt because they're worried about a bond downgrade, you know, making things even mm-hmm. worse. Right. Probably if they got downgraded, their interest um, rates would go up on some of that debt. So they're trying to get get past that. Uh, my, my next question for you is: You live, I guess, around the Houston, Texas area. How bad are things there in terms of like people losing their jobs or people being put on part-time work instead of full-time? Is, is this bus similar to the 1986 bus? No, I don't think it's quite as bad. I said you, you sure wouldn't note it from our traffic. It seems like to me we have the worst traffic you've ever seen. But with all these announced layoffs, you think there'd be a lot that, that fewer cars on the on the street. But uh, anyway, no, I think it's. Uh, you know, one of those things, I went to the inter- intercom conference, and what people need to understand is when you're talking, let's say, $45 oil, the actual lifting cost of getting that oil out of the ground is more in the 12 to $15 range. So on the wells that are producing, there's still pretty good cash margin. These things, got, these companies have pretty good cash flow from operation, so they can sustain in this period. It just, what's, what is happening now, it, there's just no justification for drilling, drilling new wells. I mean, what what's changed with the shale plays is because of these long horizontal wells and the big massive frack jobs. These are eight to ten million dollar wells, and it just doesn't make any sense to deploy capital when your rate of return now at forty five dollar oil on a new well is not that good. But the existing wells, once they're drilled and that capital has already been spent, their cash flows are still pretty decent, even at forty-five dollar oil. I think if we get, I think if we get back to around sixty dollars a barrel, the industry would be absolutely fine. Yeah, I, th- I think the oil price should be if there wasn't, you know, Sa- uh, OPEC and Saudi intervention, and there wasn't, you know, Wall Street traders hopping on the trend and knocking the paper price down further, or other uh, potentially, you know, stuff with the high frequency trading. Uh, algorithms that are knocking the paper oil price down. Mm-hmm. We should be around, you know, sixty, sixty-five dollars a barrel, maybe upwards of seventy-five or eighty, somewhere in a range like that. That would seem to me to be plenty fine for most of the producers to survive and make some money and pay out some dividends and things like that. Mm-hmm. But we're not there. We're, we seem to be, you know, at a price situation now where this, a lot of the uh, supply, whether the unconventional ones. Because they've taken on debt, they seem to be in uh, a bit of trouble, at least for a while. Maybe some of them can hunker down if their costs are lower, but um, the industry just had so much cost increases over the last decade or so that you know they haven't been as efficient, I guess, as they should have been. Yeah, that's right, and nobody expected the price to drop like this. I don't even think Saudi Arabia expected the price to drop like this. I honestly think they thought that if they get oil down to $60 a barrel and it stays there for just a few months, that they'd get everybody – agreeing to make production cuts, that the other OPEC members would make production cuts with them. Uh, Russia would join the gang and make production cuts and everything would be, you know, stabilized. Uh, because they're not, I mean, they're, they're bleeding money right now. Saudi Arabia is bleeding money by probably about $10 billion a month at this current price. So, and, you know, they've got to spend a lot more money on military since they're now in a war with uh, rebels down in Yemen and they you know, face other challenges from ISIS. So they've got that to deal with. So it wouldn't surprise me if they don't change their tone here in the next few months. I mean, that that's actually what got the market going yesterday. There were some rumors coming out of OPEC that actually in a, an official OPEC publication, they said that they were, uh, you know, considering making some moves yesterday. Yeah, the Saudis also have uh, a lot of social program spending mm-hmm. that they're they're to balance their budget. I think they needed over a hundred dollar barrel barrel oil because they promised all this health care and education to a lot of their young unemployed adult adult males there who are not properly educated with the right skills to get good high paying full time jobs. And then they've tapped the bond market, you know, with billions of dollars recently, I guess, mm-hmm. because of the low oil price. And I think they even hired a Wall Street investment bank to figure out how to cut costs, uh, tens of billions of costs from their government to make themselves. Leaner. I guess it's no wonder then that um, you know OPEC. There's been rumblings, and I think you were the one who actually told me about this through your sources in Abu Dhabi. Mm-hmm. That there was rumors of an uh, OPEC emergency meeting because the higher cost OPEC producers, the ones who don't have a balanced budget and need much higher oil, you know, they're begging the Saudis for production cuts. But you know, I don't think they're the ones who would do the cut. Right. The, the, yeah. Nobody else wants a cut because they they got used to Saudi making all the cuts and then not having to do anything. 
and they got kind of spoiled by that. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of like you, you think, how is OPEC really a cartel if the other companies never obey the rules? You know, they've all got production quotas. I mean, their production quota is 30 million barrels a day, and today they're pr- producing about 32 and a half million barrels a day. So they're, everybody's producing above their quotas. If they would announce tomorrow that they're going to go back to their quotas, you'd see oil spike back to 70 or 80 dollars like uh, immediately. So uh, you know they hold the keys. They could they could definitely uh, ramp the price back up if they want to. I want to talk about demand in this market. You know, we've we I've seen people I've spoken uh, I've seen people other oil experts other people who pay attention to markets. They say that oh China is collapsing, demand is collapsing in oil, but I don't see any evidence that demand has collapsed. I do see uh, car sales have slowed in China and other places, but there's still growth in car sales. I don't see them going to zero or negative, or people you know handing the keys to the car back to the dealer or selling as many cars that they own as they can. Uh, do you see demand uh, in this market uh, starting to stabilize and possibly grow by the end of the year? Well, the one thing – I looked at China the other day, and here's what people need to remember. Their uh, energy uh, program is really based on coal. Coal – burning coal produces about 60 percent of their total energy, including transportation, including everything. And uh, oil only represents about 20 percent. So it's coal 60%, oil 20%, and then the other 20% is made up of some natural gas, nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, biofuels, you name it. But but, but uh, oil is not as big of a part of their energy mix as it is in the U.S. And uh, the thing you said, said, I think even if the Chinese economy you know slows from 7% growth to 5% growth, it's still growing. And car sales are still going up. And SUV sales are uh, are skyrocketing in China, and uh, so I don't really see that happening. Plus, China just re- recently opened up two new strategic petroleum reserve sites, and they've said they're going to fill those, and that's probably going to offset any decline from their economy because they're, they're talking about 150 to 200 thousand barrels a month uh, of imports to fill those strategic petroleum reserves. I mean, our government should be doing the same thing. You know, why not buy low, sell high? And while the price is down, why not use it to fill up your strategic petroleum reserve? Yeah, and it makes sense to stockpile because we right. don't know if there's any geopolitical problems in the future. If oil supply from one place where we import it, it, it could shut down. It, I think I also read in your newsletter, you said that there's supposed to be, I think, 75 million new cars added to the global fleet this year. And I've looked up Chinese car sales. And at the beginning of 2015, China was supposed to have 7% car sale growth, which was supposed to get them to 25 million new cars sold per year. But that's been revised down, I think, to 3%. But that's still you know, a good solid uh, 15%, uh, 15 million new cars added to their global fleet. I mean, that's not zero. Yeah, it's not zero. Yeah, there, I don't think their, their demand's going down. It may be slowing a bit from you know what – People were projecting six months ago, but I don't think it's going to go down. And then India is – their demand is going up. Uh, the one thing people got to remember, this was what was forgotten in the 2008-2009 cycle. When, when refined product prices go down, demand goes up. I mean, price makes a difference. There, there are now people that can afford to drive their car more or afford to buy fuel to cook their food with instead of having to cook it by burning wood. So – demand does go up. And I think that's what's really been being missed in this equation because, you know, for over a year now, the EIA and IEA have been saying that that, uh, supply is exceeding demand by 2 million barrels a day, something like that, or one and a half to 2 million barrels a day. Let's even say say it's one and a half million barrels a day. Well, where is all this production? Where where is this oil? It's missing oil because we have U.S. oil storage declining, and we have – about half the world's above ground storage capacity. And if you're going to buy oil and just store it for future use, you'd rather store it in the United States than in some other country. So where is this oil? And I think it's being consumed. I think they're just missing it on the consumption side and they're revised. And that's why they'll go back and revise their forecast. <laughs> What's kind of funny about the EIA, they, they continue to revise their forecast for over a year. They go back and and increase their forecast for what really happened in those periods because people don't understand that these numbers they put out every week, those are not actual numbers. Those are just formula-driven numbers 
based on their algorithms or whatever that, that generate these, and, and they're heavily weighted to trend. So if you have a period of a, a big, big drop in fuel prices where demand goes up, they don't really see that. They, they base their, uh, a big part of their estimate of production by country is based on the GDP of that country and what historically how fuel use and energy use has been based on their GDP growth. And they discount, and, and what they miss is what co the consumers are using more fuel. Exactly. And also, to add to your point there, in the United States, most Americans, when the oil price, the gasoline price drops, you know, they're going to, if they have a car lease, they're going to want to switch to an SUV. Or if the right. SUV was parked in the garage and maybe they weren't driving as much because the gas price was too high, they're going to switch to driving it more. So we're, we see evidence of that every time the oil price drops in the United States, mm -hmm. that, you know, Americans talk about fuel efficient cars, but when the gas price drops a lot, they all want to drive an SUV. Yeah, I've seen that SUV sales are up double digit percentage and and hybrid sales are down double double digit percentages. So, you know, the the uh decline from uh, 350 a gallon gasoline to like $2 a gallon gasoline, it's big. I mean, people don't even think as much about how much you you know, it, it's when you were filling up your car or your truck every time it was costing you $50, there's it's a lot less painful than when you're only paying 25 or 30 dollars and it doesn't seem so bad uh you don't worry about where you're driving i mean there was people probably you know tell them tell them only going to the grocery store once a week and planning around that where now they don't even worry about it yeah and the international energy agency or iea says demand they're projecting demand will be 95 million barrels per day by the end of the year so i don't know if we'll hit that mark but i mean Eventually, we are going to go in the near future, next couple of years, to 95 million barrels per day, and that's three billion barrels, over three billion barrels per year of oil that needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So I see a market where, you know, over the long term, demand from the developing world is still increasing. We have potential supply problems if the oil price stays this low, and other people don't think that. But you know, if the price stays this low, we are going to have supply problems because there's not going to be as much money to invest in oil, and a lot of the oil producers now have a lot of debt problems they have to deal with. So I, I don't see a situation here where they can easily bring on a lot of supply because there's not as, mu not as much capital available now to bring on supply uh, that easily without the price going a lot higher. Yeah, and even if it does, it, it takes time to uh, change the momentum. Like once uh, production starts going down, it, it takes a lot of capital. It takes a lot of planning, logistics of lining up rigs, lining up completion crews, lining up all the fuels and fluids and sand and chemicals and everything you need to drill that well, uh, it takes time. So once you, once you pretty much halt your drilling program to get it geared up again, and remember, a lot of these people have been laid off, so they went and got other jobs. And uh, to restaff your crews and everything, that takes time. So, um, you know, it's just always during this transition period. So, I mean, I think if oil went up to $80 tomorrow, you would see uh, – U.S. production continue on a climb probably through the end of the year before it could start going back up again. Yeah, that's exactly right. There's actually, from my sources, there's been a lot of uh, people losing their jobs in mm -hmm. the Bakken. Either they were put on unpaid leave, technically not fired, or you know actually fired or or switched to part time. So there's been you know over a hundred thousand people. Actually, from one source, I heard over two hundred fifty thousand people in the Bakken mm -hmm. uh, lost their jobs. So it's a it's a massive amount. Yeah, and really true, yeah. since. Yeah, and since 2008, I think, Dan, I think like the shale oil industry, that was almost all the high-paying full-time jobs created in the United States, according to the government's own jobs data, was like uh, oil jobs that were the best job creator in the United States. Yeah, they do pay well. I mean, there was truck drivers making sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year, you know, just to drive water trucks around and stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it uh, definitely hurts the economy, and then those guys get laid off, and they can't, you know, find a job even close to that, so... Yeah, it's pretty painful. The way I, I always tell people, uh, just think about it. every every rig that gets shut down probably costs a hundred jobs because it's not just the people working the rigs. Remember, these rigs run twenty four hours a day, so they have like three crews, you know, that are on that rig, and so uh, then you got all the completion crews and all the oil field services that go with drawing the drawing the well. They're bringing supplies and stuff there every day, so it's about a hundred people lose their job with every rig that gets shut down. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And then also the service sector jobs, you know, the shopping malls and the restaurants and the bars around there, too. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's no oil jobs, there's no people spending money uh, after work and stuff like that either. 
Yeah, I was I was when I was on Denver a couple of weeks ago at the Intercom Conference, and I got to talking to this gal from uh, Calgary actually, and she said that Calgary is really suffering. Uh, you know, Calgary is kind of the midland of of the oil business up in in Canada. The whole the whole city is based on the oil industry, and she said their real estate prices have been crushed and lots of people out of work up there. So. Yeah, I mean, this is this happens, though, in a commodity market. You know, you get booms and busts and things like that, and you get um, malinvestment with too much capital going and bad debt and, yeah. and bad acquisitions at the top and things like that. Uh, my, my next question is about natural gas. Uh, where it looks like, you know, towards the end of this year, we're going to have Chenier Energy start to export maybe some LNG, mm-hmm. and we have other uh, LNG exports facilities approved that are being constructed now. Uh, do you think the natural gas market is uh, – there's any good investments there? Yeah, I think the natural uh, – first of all, crude oil trades on a global market, and natural gas trades on regional market. So think of the North American market as one region, basically the United States and Canada. And, uh, and we have very little export capacity until Chenier comes online. But when Chenier comes online – hang on for a minute. Let me turn this off. Well, I can't get it. Anyway, when Chenier uh, brings their first train uh, on by the end of this year, because I, uh, I, when I was out in Denver, the CEO of Chenier was one of the speakers, and he said they're on track to come online by the end of the year. Uh, they're going to start exporting about two, two and a half billion cubic feet per day. But between now and the year 2020, you're going to increase exports almost 10 BCF per day. Well, that's pretty big because this is a this is a market of about 78. Uh, uh, TC, uh, 20, I'm sorry, 78 billion cubic feet a day. That's the U.S. market. So if they increase exports by nine, that's over 10, 12 percent of our total production is now going to be exported. So that increases demand within the United States. And we're using more and more for power generation as we shut down these coal-fired plants, uh, you know, just transportation, industrial demand, and, you know, probably 90, 95 percent of the homes that are built every year uh, heat their homes with gas. So uh, gas demand goes up year after year after year, about, about two and a half, three BCF a day. And uh, I think it's going to tighten. And, and natural gas production is going down because the number of rigs drilling for gas has also dropped by about 30 or 40 percent. Yeah, it, it looks very interesting. Uh, what what I would worry about with some of these LNG companies is if they don't have long term contracts for a profitable uh, LNG price. Mm-hmm. So if you know they're they're looking for a market price and all this extra uh, export capacity comes online, you know then the price is going to drop and the company, if they have a lot of debt to build their LNG export facility, they're in trouble. So if they have you know stable uh, long term export contracts with all these different utilities, I think those are the companies that are going to be safer and reliable with their cash flows. Well, Chenier's got pretty much all of their capacity totally booked. So their sales are pretty much locked in. And they're locking in their supplies with hedges, too. They're locking in their price with hedges. So they're, they're in pretty good shape. Uh, now, I think with the U.S. entering the LNG market, it may bring down global gas prices. Uh, we're the world's number one gas producer. We're the world's number one gas consumer. But uh, now that we entered that LNG market, it's probably going to hurt places like Australia that have, you know, pretty much captured the Asian market, and that's where the big prices are. Yeah, the Asian natural gas price, I think, is is like two or three times as high as in the United States, in Japan, and in China, and things like that. As the Chinese, I guess, look to shut down some of their coal-fired mm-hmm. power plants and transition to other forms of energy. In in Asia, the price of natural gas is tied to the price of oil. So it's a percentage of like one sixth the price of oil. Um, in the United States, it's totally uh, a separate market. Like it, it trades totally separate. So like our gas is you know two dollars or or two fifty. Uh, if you take six times that, we're only up to like fifteen dollars per uh, for six uh, MCF of gas. So. Uh, it is it, it's a different market, and it's a very high price market in Europe and uh, in Asia. So there, there's quite a profit margin. Let's say it takes two or 250 to uh, compress it, cool it, and then heat it at the other end. Uh, you, you still got quite a bit of profit margin on exported LNG. My my last question for you for this interview mm-hmm. is, 
you know, you write an oil investing newsletter about income stock, uh, income, uh, income oil dividend companies and MLPs, and also uh, more risky exploration and production companies that are growing their production profitably. Mm -hmm. What types of companies are safe in this environment then? Well, you know, your large caps, they're going to survive. The EOGs of the world, uh, EOG, Continental, Devon, I was looking at today. And these companies, they're, they're oversold. Uh, unless you just think oil prices are going to stay this low forever, uh, these things are grossly oversold. So there, there's uh, – and, and I see kind of a sentiment, a sentiment shift in the market, which is what – you know, we had a pretty good rally the last couple of days. Today they're down because the oil price is down a little, little bit. But uh, – uh, you know, this is an industry that the world needs. I mean, this this world runs on uh, hydrocarbon-based energy. We're going to be using, you know, oil, gas, and coal to generate 80, 90 percent of our energy for a heck of a long time, and uh, you know, it's got to come back to replacement costs. So, uh, you know, the, the price of oil now is uh, at 45 dollars a barrel is to me grossly uh, unsustainable. Uh, you're just going to see a big decline in production, and, and the, the market forces are at work. This happens every cycle. The price comes down, production comes down, demand goes up, and, uh, you know, things get balanced out. And it, it may not happen in the next few months. It may take a year, but I think we'll crawl back to the long-term uh, long price trend. Uh, the one thing I will say, I think I think $70 is the new $100. Uh, the, the cost of drilling and completing these wells is – has gotten a lot lower. They've, uh, you know, figured out how to complete these things smarter. Uh, as they go to pad drilling, where they're drilling multiple wells from one location, that really cuts down on their cost per well. And uh, I think if we get back to 70, these things, these companies will still be making great profit margins. So, uh, it, you know, for the long-term investor, this is a great buying opportunity right now. Yeah, and we have people on Wall Street, a lot of the traders, you know, they looked at the oil price in the chart, and they were telling me, you know, oil for sure. I, I remember talking with Robert Rapier about this, you know, Robert, mm -hmm. and he was getting a lot of backlash from the people because he writes for Wall Street Journal, and they were like, oh, oil's definitely going down to 30, or oil's definitely going down to 20. I'm 100% sure of this. And, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe it does for a short amount of time, but the amount of carnage it would cause in the industry, I mean, it would it would set the oil industry back for years in terms of being able to raise capital and producers going bust and things like that. It, you could probably say the lower it goes, the faster it will rebound <laughs> because you just have everybody shutting down everything. There's no way it goes to 30 and stays there for any length of time because you'd have everybody stopping all drilling. Uh, and it, yeah, that'd be, it and that'd be devastating. That'd be devastating to the market, really. Yeah, it would. It would potentially destabilize governments too. You know, most of the right. OPEC governments, how dependent they are. You know, we could see Venezuela collapse even faster, or some of these some of these OPEC countries collapse even faster. So I, I think, you know, these guys who are drawing the trend lines, you know, they 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 hopped on either the Saudis or whoever else were trying to talk the price lower. They made a nice trade here, shorting oil down, and then now they're they're getting greedy. By looking at the trend line and trying to get more, and that's why we had you know this really big short squeeze because so many people were short on the paper oil market and they were expecting it to go even lower when it already had gone very low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the, the paper market is what drives the price. It's not like producers negotiating with refineries or anything. And the the paper market is like 20 to 25 times larger than the physical market. So you got a lot of guys trading these oil futures. Uh, that are just speculators and some of them are doing it as a hedge against the dollar and whatever thing, things like that. So, uh, oh, yeah. you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of different motivations in the, in the oil market on NYMEX. Yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, there being more paper than the actual underlying commodity and the producers not really being able to set the price as much. We have that in gold and silver where there's over a hundred times the amount of paper contracts per ounce of gold or ounce of silver. Uh, that's, that's actually right. in existence. So it's, it's pretty mind-boggling there that you know all these paper trading speculator stuff and these high-frequency trading algorithms that they drive the price when you know the producers this is the one who hurts them the most and then you know they're run the risk of not being able to produce the commodity that the world actually needs. Right, right. Well, Dan, I just want to thank you again for your time. Uh, please tell our listeners more about the Energy Prospectus Group. Well, the Energy Prospectus Group, you can check it out at just energyprospectus.com. And we're a subscription service, and we publish a newsletter every three weeks, but we also publish individual company profiles. Publish about 200 of those a year, so uh, we're 
we're constantly looking for for good ideas. And uh, like I was saying a few minutes ago, there a lot of these companies are grossly oversold, so I think there's some great great prices out there. And uh, we're we're also looking for companies that do pay really good dividends, preferred stocks that pay really solid dividends. There's a lot of them now that have double digit annual uh, dividend rates uh, because they pulled back. So. Uh, you know, it, it's a it's an industry that's going to be around for a long time. It's an industry the world needs, and uh, and I think it's a, a good place for investors to have at least some energy in their in their portfolios. And we can help in our we don't tell you what to buy, but we hopefully give you some good ideas of companies to look at. And uh, you know, we look pretty hard at their their asset base and their debt and uh, and all that when we write a profile on them. Yeah, I agree. And in terms of valuation, I mean, the oil industry has some of the best valuations out there of any uh, industry in the stock market. There's people are paying uh, way higher valuations uh, for you know dividends and things like that in regular stocks and other industries. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks again for your time, Dan. And we'll have you on again in a couple months. And uh, hopefully, we'll have the oil prices higher. Yeah. Or there's going to be a lot more carnage. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot.